So the light dependent reactions or light reactions of photosynthesis. First thing is, where does it all occur? So if you think about a plant cell, I didn't draw that. Okay, a plant cell, here's the cell wall and here's the cell membrane or whatever. Um, the organelles that do photosynthesis are called chloroplasts. And that's not to scale, of course. Um, the chloroplast has this sort of double membrane. And inside, it has these sacs. That's also not to scale. So w the chloroplast divides um, space into separate compartments. Uh, this compartment here is called the stroma. Um, this stack of sacs is called a granum. You can't see that. Granum. The plural is grana. And each of the sacs themselves is called a thylakoid. So when we talk about the carbon reactions, that happens in the stroma. The light reactions happen in and on the thylakoids. So we're going to we're going to sort of zoom in on the thylakoid. Now the thylakoid is also just a sac. Um, it's this sort of flat pancake sort of thing of membrane and you know, being a sac, it divides the universe into two spaces. So out here is the stroma, and in here is called the thylakoid space. And, and the story that I'm going to tell is actually going to start on the boundary between these two spaces on the thylakoid membrane. So on the membrane, there are molecules uh, that are that are pigments. Now, a pigment is just a molecule that interacts with light of particular colors. Um, and when I say interact with, I mean that when light comes in, so light is going to come in. When light comes in, uh, the, the energy is absorbed by one of these pigment molecules. When I say absorbed, I mean that the energy in the light um, changes the molecule. And the way that it changes the molecule is that it makes one of the electrons in, in the molecule, it makes one of those electrons kind of move up to a higher energy orbital than it's supposed to be in. So um, that is not an equilibrium state. It's not, a, it's not a stable state. The electron shouldn't be at that higher energy uh, orbital. So, um, so, so it's an ex what we call, it, we call it an excited electron. That excited electron is going to come back down to its ground state, to its lower energy state. The energy that is released when the electron comes back down is going to be passed to a neighboring pigment molecule through this mysterious process called resonance energy transfer. But all that means is that that energy is going to cause another pigment molecule to have an excited electron. When that electron comes back down, that energy will be passed to a different molecule. So if you think of all these pigment molecules um, passing their energy around, then you can sort of see that um, people often think of like a beach ball at a concert. It just gets pa passed around um, until it reaches sort of the pigment that's right in the middle. Um, so you can think of this whole thing as being sort of like a dish antenna. You know, it, it, it sort of increases the surface area um, that can receive energy. And the energy ends up being passed to this middle pigment. This middle pigment is called the reaction center. And these, so this is the reaction center. Reaction center. And these are called the antenna pigments. And the whole thing, the whole thing you can call, well, we're just going to call it a photosystem. Here, let me write that more neatly. Photosystem. So these pigments in the thylakoid membrane, they receive light energy. The energy is converted from being light 
to the energy of these excited electrons. That energy is eventually passed to the reaction center. When the reaction center receives that energy, it's also going to excite an electron. But that electron, when it gets excited, instead of being passed, in, instead of the electron coming back down to its ground state and that energy being passed along, the energy is going, the, the electron itself is going to be passed to an electron transport chain. So here's the thylakoid, here's the photosystem, and here's the, the reaction center. The reaction center is going to pass its excited high energy electron to a series of molecules that are also embedded in the thylakoid membrane. Um, and these uh, molecules are really good at passing electrons from one to the other. The electron moves from one to the, to the next because each time the electron is in a sort of a stabler situation. You know, each each um, subsequent molecule is a little bit more electronegative than the one before. So the electron is losing energy. It's becoming stabler and losing energy along the way. These molecules are able to use that energy to do some work. The work that they do is to pump H plus ions, um, also called protons, because that's what a, an H plus ion would be. A hydrogen atom without the electron is just a proton. So it pumps protons into the inside of the thylakoid, into the thylakoid space. So you can think of the thylakoid space as being really acidic. It's got a lot of excess H pluses. Um, if you have already studied aerobic respiration, this should look really, really familiar to you. If you haven't yet, keep this in mind because it will make what happens in the mitochondria look really, really familiar to you. Anyway, so the electron transport chain is going to create this concentration and charge gradient, um, a proton gradient, by pumping H pluses into the inside. Having all these excess protons on the inside, in, in the thylakoid space, that is an unstable, far from equilibrium. It's, a, it's an unstable situation. The H pluses can't just diffuse back out through this membrane. The only way they can get out is through these protein complexes called ATP synthases. And as you can guess from the name, what an ATP synthase does is it, when it lets an H plus come back out, it's going to come out and release some energy because we're relieving a little bit of this, um, of this proton gradient. And when that energy is released, that energy is used. The ATP synthase uses that energy to phosphorylate an ADP, that is to tack a phosphate onto the ADP, turning it into ATP. And I'm just going to make, make the ATP look like it's high energy because it's high energy. So this is how the energy of the light is used to, is, is converted into the energy of ATP, right? The whole point here is to take ADP and make it into ATP, that's endergonic. That process is driven by what? By a crowded proton being allowed to become an uncrowded proton. But where did we get that crowded proton to begin with? Well, that was driven by the, these molecules of the electron transport chain. So the energy from that comes from um, a high energy electron being allowed to become a low energy electron. And where did that high energy electron come from? Well, it came from the excitation of the electron from, um, from light being absorbed by the pigment. So light. So this chain of energy transformations, um, transforming energy from light to the electron energy, to the proton energy, to, to ATP. If I were to sort of draw it like a graph, uh, where, the, where on this graph, um, you know, something like this is uh, uh, energy level, And this is sort of the progression of, the, of this process. Um, we're going to start with a photos, the photosystem. The photosystem is going to look like that. Um, and the electron gets, the, so the light comes in, right? And the electron gets excited. 
and it gets passed to the electron transport chain, and 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 so it's 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 going down in energy. What happens to the electron then? The electron then gets passed to yet another photosystem. Okay, so we have two photosystems involved. The first photosystem that we uh, encountered was called photosystem two, and the second one is called photosystem one. Um, photosystem one was figured out first. Um, scientists figured out photosystem one first, and that's why that's why the names seem backward. Okay, so the electron, after passing through the electron transport chain and losing a lot of its energy, um, and that energy, of course, is used, you know, eventually to make ATP, uh, that electron gets passed to a second photosystem. When that photosystem also receives light, then it's going to excite an electron again. So we're again going to have an excitation of an electron. But this time, instead of being passed to an electron transport chain, it's going to be passed to an enzyme called NADP reductase. Here, I'll write it up here. NADP reductase. And what NADP reductase does is it transfers that electron to a molecule of NADP and turns it into NADPH. And that is a high energy molecule. So this second part of the light reactions um, generates NADPH. So that's where the electron goes. This whole process of the electron going through the electron transport chain to make ATP, being passed to photosystem one, where the electron is excited and passed to NADP reductase to uh, reduce NADP into NADPH, this is what we call acyclic electron flow. Uh, because the electron never sort of loops back on itself. There's something else that sometimes happens, which is the electron instead of being passed on to NADP reductase, can actually be um, uh, moved this way back into the electron transport chain to produce more ATP. This has to happen because, as you'll see in the next video when we talk about the carbon reactions, um, the Calvin cycle requires more ATP than NADPH. So the, this, this, uh, the light reactions that make ATP and NADPH, they have to be rigged to make more ATP, and this is how it does is that sometimes the electron from photosystem one, sometimes it gets excited and passed to NADP reductase. That's acyclic flow. But sometimes it gets passed back to the electron transport chain to make more ATP, and you can sort of see that that kind of is cyclic because you could imagine an electron just being passed around and around in this little loop forever. So that would be called cyclic flow, cyclic electron flow. Now, by the way, what happens to the electron? Well, what happens to the electron here is that it goes out into NADPH and it just leaves the system. But, but what, happened, what happened to photosystem 2, right? It, it gave up an electron. Um, it, its electron got excited and then got got sent through um, this electron flow process until it went into NADPH, and the electron um, or an, another one just like it just disappeared. So what happens to this photosystem? Is it out an electron? You know, is it sort of stuck having an electron hole? And the answer is no. The answer is what happens is when this thing loses its electron it becomes very, very electronegative. It becomes very, very electron thirsty. So thirsty that it is able to split water. And so this is, this is what we call the hydrolysis, um, or the water splitting, not hydrolysis, but water splitting um, function of photosystem two, is that it's able to take a water and break it apart, like grab an electron from the water. And when that happens, the water splits and becomes hydrogen, and sort of importantly for us animals, oxygen. So this is how plants are able to release oxygen, is because they split water to grab electrons from the water. And, uh, and in so doing, they release oxygen. If they didn't do this, there would never have been animal life on Earth.